This morning we come uh, to this issue, this glorious passage in Psalm 46 of God's great grace. Now, notice the screen in front of you. We've seen a lot of these images in recent days, right? Probably more than we would like to see. In fact, this is the current track as of 5 a.m. this morning, and um, we don't know what it's going to do. Notice how the, the major symbols are all stacked up on top of each other. Um, there's supposed to be 12 hours between each one of those, but what that simply means is, is that the storm is predicted to not continue to move very much. Now, there's two bad things about that. The first bad thing about that is that there are islands underneath those round dots. That's northern Bahamas, and I cannot imagine 150 miles an hour winds blowing for a long period of time. You know, heavy winds do a lot of damage, um, but heavy winds for a long time do much more damage. Things break down and, uh, over a period of time. So we need to be really praying for the people uh, in that area. The other bad thing about that is the longer it, it lingers there, it's not that it's necessarily going to get stronger, but it just becomes even yet a little bit more unpredictable. Um, so in that regard, we do need to keep an eye on it, mainly because it's such a powerful storm. If it was a Category 1, it wouldn't be a big deal if it was so close and unpredictable. But because it is a Category 4, it is wise for us um, to, well, has it become a 5 this morning? Thank you. Y'all are infor informing me. So because it's a Category 4 or 5, um, I don't know that it really matters after Category 3, um, but it's because it becomes very destructive. But we do need to pay attention. And so we take this moment to just say to you, I um, want to encourage you um, to, if you haven't done very much preparation for you to do that, you have time this afternoon. And if you need help, um, there are going to be some deacons, deacon guys. I'd like to ask some of you to come stand right up here in the front as soon as the service is over. Um, and uh, they will be able to, if you have a particular need, um, we want you to be able to talk to them about that, and uh, we can see if we can help you. There are, there's a lot of things here that these images represent to us. They represent to us danger. They represent to us trouble. But you know, the troubles and the dangers of our lives um, very often look a lot different than this, more commonly look a lot different than this. Sometimes the troubles and the dangers of our lives are found on a piece of paper that we get in the mail, or they're found on a piece of paper that the doctor is holding when he sits down with us, and he tells us what the results are. Sometimes it's the paper that the sheriff's office delivers to your door. Sometimes it's a Another type of struggle, sometimes it's in the conversation that you have with a loved one, and the relationship is filled with turmoil and difficulty. Sometimes the storms of our life have to do with the memories of the past, and the memories of the past can bring about a struggle and a difficulty that can be gripping and that can be incredibly distracting to our joy into all the things that we've hoped for. My friends, while we are in a fallen world, we have storms. And I'm going to comment more on this at the end of the message than at the beginning, but these storms and these struggles, these troubles that we have are very, very much related in that they all ultimately come from the same source. They ultimately come from a, from a moment in time when we chose our own way and we knew better than God. It is through the fall from the beautiful picture of God's wondrous perfect design into our own self-will and our sin when suddenly the curse of that sin comes raging down through the generations into our lives. And sometimes it may be directly because of something you did, or it may have nothing to do with specifically something that you have done. 
But because we live in a fallen world, we've all had consequences that were a result of our own sin. And we've all had consequences that were a result of someone else's sin. But however it comes, the great troubles and the great struggles of this life come. But there is a saving king. There is a saving God who says, I have made you. You have fallen into sin, but I will redeem you. And I can become your refuge, the place that you run to when the storm comes. So this morning we come to Psalm 46, one of the greatest places in Scripture that we see the great refuge of God given to us. I want you to notice here with me very briefly this morning, Psalm 46, the overview. First of all, this is one of the five Psalms in Psalm 46, 48, 76, 87, and 122. It's one of the five Psalms that highlight God's capital city. In God's capital city on the earth, it's a place that he's chosen to work and make ground zero for his touchdown with us is Zion or Jerusalem. You see, it was in this city and it was on this mountain where Abraham would offer up Isaac to the Lord in faith. And then in perfect, glorious grace of God, he would come and stop the knife and say, Abraham, I see that you believe in me. And that was the picture, the father of our faith, as he can, then it's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that would come as the patriarchs of faith, looking to God and listening to God. And eventually, there on that very place, a temple would be built. And the city would be built. And there, it's in that place that the Davidic king line would come. And listen to this. It's not so much about King David as it is about God's covenant with Israel to provide a king. And not just David as a king, but far greater, there would be a Davidic king who would become the king of kings and the Lord of lords. That's why Jesus was born in the line of David, in the royalty of David. We see him as the prophet, priest, and king. And so he is the ultimate king, the final king, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. This is God in the flesh who would come. And so Psalm 46 helps us see this important place on the earth where God has chosen to reveal, listen to this, his redeeming plan, his saving us out of our trouble, his saving us out of our sin. He's saying, it's not just that you've fallen in sin, but I am a God who loves to show my love. I love to show my grace. I love to show my mercy. And I will just, I will call you to myself. I will come and show you that I can provide the refuge from your trouble. Number two here, notice with me, this psalm focuses on God's absolute sovereignty, on his absolute sovereignty over all kings and all things. He's Lord over every king, and he's Lord over everything that has been created. Because he is the creator, and the, our very first song that we sang this morning had to do with the holiness of God. He is our God. Holy. Holy means set apart, not like the rest. That means, listen to me, that, that's such an important description of God, that God is holy. Because you see, if he wasn't set apart from us, then he would be really like us. And if he was really like us, he couldn't save us. But because he's not like us, because he's not like the rest, because he's holy, that's what holy means, set apart, different than everything else. Because he is so different than everything else, the creator and the creation are very, very different. Pantheism says, oh no, the creation is God. And God says, no, I made all things. I am God. Don't worship the creation. Worship the creator who made all things. And so we see his absolute sovereignty over all kings and all things. Number three, we're going to see here, um, and this, is, this is really goes to the, even the first 
a um, couple of verses here. It inspired, this Psalm 46 inspired Martin Luther's great hymn, A Mighty Fortress, or A Mighty Fortress is Our God. He was on his way to the city of Worms to a trial where he would be condemned and be excommunicated from the Roman Catholic Church for saying, hey, wait a minute, no, salvation is only through God. It's not through anything else. It's not through the church. It's not through your good works. It's not through the pope. It's not through the cardinals. It's not through the traditions of the church. It's not through any of those things. It's not through what anybody would ever do except Christ and Christ alone. And so he was being condemned for that. And in the process of that, on his way to this event, he was meditating on Psalm 46. And he was meditating on verse 1 of Psalm 46. And it was from verse 1 of Psalm 46 that he was inspired to write the beautiful five verses of a mighty fortress is our God. We're not going to sing it this morning, but we can remember it. Our church has sung it a lot over the last few years. We've looked at the story of Martin Luther and the Great Reformation, but it was in 1521 that he came to that. So let's read the psalm, and let's keep in mind these things, that this is God's supreme salvation that he is bringing to a fallen world with struggles and troubles that are very, very significant. Look at the verse 1 with me. In Psalm 46 and verse 1, circle the first word, God. Circle that, big and bold. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, selah, which means pause and think about that. Could be a musical interlude, but it's, it's good for us to, to be reminded to just kind of think about what we've just read. Now, you could put out the side of verse 3, Dorian, I don't know. You could put out there Andrew. You could put out there whatever one was yours that got you somewhere along the way. Though the mountains roar and foam, though the mountains tremble, or the, the waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. He's saying here the struggle is great. Let's go on and let's read. Number four, verse four. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. Here is Zion. Here is Jerusalem. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage. The kingdom, the, the morning dawns. The nations rage. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. And then let's read verse 7 together. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Verse 8 goes on. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. How he makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. We're going to see what that means. Then verse 10. Be still. And know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Let's read verse 11. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Let's break it down in these three sections. First of all, verses 1 through 3 show us this, that you can have God's perspective regarding your trouble in this earthly life. You can have God's perspective regarding your trouble in this earthly life. Now, let's be clear. Most people don't have God's perspective about this earthly trouble. Most people have their own perspective or our society's perspective. We have popular thinking perspective about it. We have these ideas. But the Bible reveals to us, God's Word reveals to us, God's perspective on our earthly troubles in this life. 
And what, what do we see here? Look what it says in verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. So his perspective is he's here and he is coming to help his children in the midst of their trouble. Look at verse 2. Therefore, we will not fear though the earth gives way. So when the ground begins to tremble below your feet, when the thing that is most certain to you, even the ground that you stand on, begins to give way, you say, well, what could be, what could be more basic than our standing on the ground? And he's saying that even when the earth begins to fail, there's something that goes beyond that. Look what it says. Though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved. Who moves mountains? Into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam through the mountains, tremble at its swelling. He's saying that the Lord is greater than these and is a very present help. And he's saying that even though everything around you shakes, we do not need to have fear. Now, what in the world? How in the world can that be? And I want you to fill this in. God's ultimate reality and security, keyword, transcend our earthly reality and its threats. You see, the reality of God is greater than the reality of this present life and physical time and space that we're in right now. The reality is, is that we see things here and we think this is so people say, well, I can't believe it unless I see it and all of these you know, things about wanting the empirical evidence right in front of them. And, and, and I would just say to you, once you begin to see the whole message of the Bible, we begin to realize that this, while it seems so real around us, what we can feel, taste, see, experience and so forth, there is a reality that's even more real than what this seems to be. Now, part of the problem is, and part of the, part of the way we can see this, is the fact that there's a lot of things that we believe that aren't true. There's things that we're under the impression of that we think are true, which simply are not true. I mean, for many, time, for many uh, millennia, people thought the world was flat, and God is, in His Word, making clear that actually it's round. I mean, we, we, we see there's all kinds of things that humanity has believed that have turned out to be false, and we come to start to realize that there is a reality that goes beyond our present experience. And what we see here is the most sure things in your life, when, in verse 2 and 3, when they start to give way, you need something that goes beyond them. And what Psalm 46 is telling us is that God goes beyond them. You see, notice this and fill this in. If the earth is failing, but you are safe, then a greater reality is present. If the earth is failing and you are safe, which is what Psalm 46 verse 1 and 2 is making clear, then there is a greater reality. Part of our problem is we think that the greatest reality is the one that's in front of us right now. The greatest reality is what all of eternity will be like, walking in the truth and knowing the truth of what God has said. That is the greatest reality. And that is where we experience his glorious truth. In verses 40, or 4 through 7, notice what it says here. Let's read them again to be reminded of them. Again, he says, There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Now, this is at first pointing to Jerusalem. This is at first pointing to Zion here on earth. But we begin to see through the, if you read, if you keep reading through the Bible, you begin to see that the things that are set up here in this earthly reality begin to be transposed and transcended into a greater reality of God's glorious eternal plan. And God's glorious eternal plan is, is that the focus isn't on a city in Israel, the focus becomes on a city that is ultimately the presence of God for all eternity. Now, in some interesting ways, I believe that Zion plays into that. I believe that there will be a play in, into that in the future. But the bigger picture, the grander scheme is this presence of God 
this greater reality that transcends whatever this world throws at you. So notice here, not only verses 1 through 3, we said you can have God's perspective, but verses 4 through 7 show you can have God's help. You can have God's help amidst your trouble in this earthly life. And that is the picture that we see here, verses 4 through 7. He's saying that even as all of these things come about, there is a reality of the Creator God who has a city that He brings help. Now, you see, fill this in, your world will be shaken, but your God and His salvation will not. See, the, the fact of the matter is, is that the nations rage, the kingdoms totter, and his, he utters his voice, and the earth melts. The world is going to pass away. But there's two things that will not pass away. The first one is God's word, and the second one is his people. God says that he redeems his people to be with him. He loves, he created us to be with him. He loves us, he saves us to be with him. So your world will be shaken, but your God and your salvation will not. Now, how do we see that? Look at verse 4 with me. It says, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. Now, here's the the amazing thing. Fill this in. His his help is available. In verse 4, we see that his resources are your resources. And that's what the psalmist is saying. He's saying, man, you stay with God in his city and listen to this. There's streams of water. Now, in the day when you would have a walled city, one of the biggest problems when an enemy was coming to attack your city, you might have a nice big wall and you might have some great big gates and you might have plenty of people to defend it and you close the gates and there you are you say great we're safe in our high city right here and the outside army can't get in but what's the big question how long can you stay like that eventually when the whole city is there and they're drinking all the water and they're eating all the food eventually what happens you run out But here the picture is this. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. It's a holy habitation of the Most High, El Yon. This is the name of God saying, this is is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And his city is an everlasting city with unlimited resources. His city is never going to run out of water. You can stay in his city and be safe from the enemies around forever. You see, look what it says in verse 5. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. Now look at the next part, end of verse 5. God will help her when morning dawns. You see, when a city is under siege, the great concern is morning light. Even great armies, they typically did not attack in the dark. So they would, they would amass their troops around, they would get in position, and then when first light would come, that would often be when the attack would come. And so this is saying, when the morning dawns and you're expecting the fight, you're expecting the rage, look at this, he's saying, God will help her when morning dawns. You see, sometimes you feel like all of life is against me. Everything that I've done in the past is coming back to get me. Or the people around me is is in the struggle. Or my body is breaking down. Or my finances are running out. Or my relationships are broken. Or my sin just keeps coming back and I keep messing it up. I keep messing up the things that are around me. I don't know what all your your struggles and your troubles are, but here is the picture, is that God is a refuge and strength for his people, and that God comes and he builds within us and around us his fortress of love and provision. Look what it says in verse, so, so in verse, the first part there is, his resources are your resources. The second part, verses five and six, his power is your victory. You see in verse five, he says, God is in the midst of her. 
So it's his presence and his power that is your victory. And look at the next part there. His presence is your deliverance. We see that in verse 7. It says, the Lord of hosts is with us. Now, circle the, the all caps word LORD. In the ESV, whenever you see all caps L-O-R-D, that is the word Yahweh. And the word Yahweh is the personal name of God. So this is not just a picture of, when, when you say Lord of hosts, that, that's a military term. Host, that means all of your warriors. And so this is saying the one true God, and we even, he's here invoking his personal name. That his, this is Yahweh God. This is the God of your salvation. This God is with us. It's not Satan with his hosts. It's not David with his hosts. This is Yahweh with his hosts. The God of Jacob is our fortress. So, verses 1 through 3 up there, we said you can have God's perspective on regarding your trouble. Verses 4 through 7, you can have God's help amidst your trouble in this life. Look at verses 8 through 11, and we're going to see that you can have God's peace amidst your trouble in this earthly life. Really? Peace in the midst of the trouble? Yes, and Jesus, Jesus really wanted us to see this um, while he was in earthly ministry here. He really wanted us to see that he indeed has power over everything in this world, including the weather. And so we, we see that he's with his disciples, and multiple times we see that they are afraid and he is the one who shows them that he has power over everything in their life, including the wind and the waves. And so Jesus uses the opportunity to show them. He, in the midst of the storm, he comes walking to them uh, at one point. He gets in the boat. He stands up, and he says, peace, be still. And immediately the storm stops. Now, my friends, what he's saying to them is this. This is his way of saying, I'm God. Watch what I can do. I'm God. So when he dies on the cross, what he's saying is, I'm God paying for your sin. I am God. I have the power to take on your sin. I have the grace to take on your sin. I will take it to death. And when he rises from the dead, he's saying again to them, what? I'm God. I have the power to forgive you. Jesus would say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Why? Because he was God in the flesh, come to take away the sins of the world. And so we see this glorious picture that his peace is available to us in the midst of this trouble. Look at verse 8, it says, look what it says, and circle this word at the beginning of there. He says, come. It's an invitation. He says, come. Behold the works of God, how he has brought desolations on the earth. I mean, these are, this is war terms, and this is, this is natural disaster type terms. I mean, we're, we're seeing the biggest cataclysmic things that a guy in the, in the Old Testament could think about. This is the picture. He says, come, behold the works of, God, of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. And that's not talking about chariots of fire. That's a different movie, different scripture um, that is here. But he bur this is talking about the fact that God takes the fiercest army with the greatest weapons against you, and he has the ability to break those weapons. He has the ability for the flying arrow to shatter the arrow. And then, how do you burn bronze? How do you burn chariots of iron or chariots of bronze? This is saying God has the ability to take care of these fierce weapons of war. That's like saying, I can take and melt down your M1 Abrams tank. I can wreck the aircraft carrier 
Whatever you come up with to send my way, I can smash it and squash it. And the greatest weapons that you've ever developed, he can simply bring to naught. And whatever Satan can bring against you, Christ can defeat. He makes war cease. Verse 9, he makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow, he shatters the spear, he burns the chariots with fire. And after those radical statements, he says, verse 10, in light of all this, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted on the earth. So, two key things that we see in verses 8 and 10. And I want you to see them. Two key instructions. So, if you want this, if you want God's peace in the midst of the storms of life, whether it be Dorian or whether it be cancer or whether it be the car wreck or whether it be the broken relationship, here's how we do it. Number one, we carefully observe his works. We carefully observe his works. We, we stop and we look and see what he has done. Now, if you're an Old Testament person, part of the picture here is he's saying, look and see how God has defeated your enemies and fulfilled his promises. I mean, do you remember Sennacherib? Do you remember these? Do you remember the, do you remember the Philistines? Do you remember all the things that were set up against you? So that's kind of an Old Testament perspective there. But then we can come and we can say, he's, he's saying, carefully observe his works. Come behold the works of the Lord. For the Christian, what we do is we look back at Calvary. We look back and we see, we, we remember what he has done. When Jesus laid down on a wooden cross, on a Roman place of execution. And he allows them to drive nails through his feet and his hands. And he's saying, this is what victory looks like. Because I am God. And so, we observe his works. Put out there to the side, the cross of Christ. You see, common religion in this day and time says you have to do, you have to do. If you want God to accept you, you have to do these things. You have to do these works. And what the message of the Bible is, is just cast yourself on Christ. Just humble yourself and say, Christ, you're the only hope. You died for me. I, I want to receive your love and your grace and your mercy. I, I want to receive your sacrifice for me. And so it comes from not for us to do, but it comes for us to look and see what was done. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. So the first thing that we have to do is we have to remember to carefully observe what he has done. Come and see the works of the Lord. You see, it talks about desolations there in verse 8 and 9 and the great the great war over, over wars. The, you see, this is really his conquering of Satan's temptations and Satan's destruction and Satan's, te, te, Satan's um, destruction through our sin. We come to see that he is saying, I break the power of sin. In fact, we have sung about it this morning. He breaks the power of canceled sin, and he sets the prisoner free. That's what he does. He breaks it. But then, not only carefully observe his works, but look at this. I love this, and it's found in verse 10. Be still and know that I'm God. We need to calmly trust his glory. Put out there to the side. Calmly trust his glory. Put out there to the side. Faith. This is what he wants us to do. He wants us to be still and see that he is in charge and trust him. And this, this sometimes is the most difficult thing. Don't pack anything up. Don't flip anything over. Look, look at this carefully. I want you to see this. Look what he says in verse 10. Be still and know that I am what? I'm God. That's as if to say this. Be still and remember that I'm God. You're not. And neither is anyone around you. The one that is attacking you, your greatest adversary, 
the world at large, Satan himself. He's saying, you be still and know that I'm the only God around here. You know, when I was a kid growing up, sometimes we'd be running around. There was three of us, and we were relatively close in age, and we were all kind of rambunctious. And we lived over here, and I mean, there were times when we would get kind of hyped up and everything, and mom and dad would be there trying to get control. Mom would kind of sometimes give up a little bit, and dad would come in in order to regain peace. And when he did, he would lay down a mandate sometimes, and we would go, why? And he'd say, because I'm the daddy. (laughs) That was the answer. I'm the daddy. This is why. There's a little bit of that right here. Be still and know that I'm God. When I'm the authority that has the power to take care of you. Look what he says. Be still and know that I'm God. I will be exalted among the nations. He's saying that the whole world is going to see that I'm the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I will be exalted in the earth, the fallen earth. I will be exalted. You see, we calmly trust his glory. And when we begin to see his glory, Philippians 4 says to us that that there's no need to be anxious for anything, but in everything with thanksgiving and prayers and supplications, we can let our requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all human comprehension, the peace of God, which surpasses Hurricane Dorian, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, and that means in his salvation. That's the greater reality. The greater reality is not whether I'm going to be saved from cancer or whether I'm going to be saved from Dorian or whether I'm going to be saved from some earthly attack. The greater reality is, am I going to be saved from my sin in eternity? And the only thing that's going to save me from my sin and its consequences of of death, condemnation, is God's own grace and salvation. And this is the glorious thing. He's saying, be still and know that I am God. I'm going to be exalted. Be anxious for nothing. Isaiah 26, 3, I love it. It says, thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, whose heart trusts in thee. You want perfect peace? Keep your mind on Christ. Let your heart trust in him. How do we put handles on all this? Flip over the sheet and kind of notice this. Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 25 really go with Psalm 46 quite well. And have your pen ready and just kind of mark some things as you would like in here, things that seem to mean something um, special to you. I'd like to ask you to do that. I want you to notice this theme of the creation in all of its trouble but God's salvation. So there's, there's trouble in our current fallen creation, but there is redemption in a gracious, loving God. Look at Romans chapter 8 and verse 18. Paul is writing, he says, For I consider that the sufferings, ooh, the sufferings of this present time, you see this present reality, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. This is the future hope. This is the future promises of God's salvation. Verse 18, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself, and get this, underline this maybe, the creation itself would be set free from its bondage to corruption. You see, we are in bondage to corruption. Our bodies break down. The car wears out. The storms come. The money suddenly flees. The thieves break in. Stuff goes wrong. To be set free from the bondage to the corruption and obtain, middle of verse 21, and obtain 
the freedom of the glory of the children of God. This is his glorious salvation. Verse 22, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. This is the picture that all of this pain and all of this struggle of a fallen life that God is still redeeming us. He's still working. He's saving people constantly, generation after generation. All of this is leading up to this beautiful, glorious restoration. This is in, likened unto the birth, childbirth until now, in verse 28, or verse 23. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the fruit, the first fruits of the Spirit. That means we've been saved. We groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our body, saying that eventually one day, even this earthly struggle is going to be done. When I think about Joyce Henson with spots all over her lungs that are cancer, when I think about many of you, I think of little Michaela, think about Edward, Billy, Bernita, Betty, I mean, we, young people, Little Michaela, she's only two, three now. We, the creation groans. The struggles are real. The trouble hurts. But God is saying, come to me in faith and listen to what I've done. Come and receive what I've done. And by faith, receive so that you can be saved from the ultimate destruction Look at verse 24. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, underline it, we wait for it with patience. And this brings glory to God as we wait for his salvation with patience. Friends, the reality is the gospel handles the great, big, huge questions of why hurricanes. I have been thinking about this a little bit, and I just, I think about the, the struggles that we have very often with understanding why things go wrong in our world. How does this fit into God? Think about this. Is there any redeeming value of a Category 5 hurricane? How can God be good when such things exist? What is the redeeming value of a hurricane? You see, tempted to think like an evolutionist, the evolutionist would say, well, there's no real value in a hurricane except that it's part of the ecosystem in which the world lives and works and has evolved. In the grand scheme of things, there's laws of physics and biology and meteorology and atmospheric conditions that create such events and that even benefit from such events. That ocean temperatures and various things that are around us and perhaps even global warming, are, our, own, our own works create these things, they would say. And in creating all of these things, some survive and some do not. But the student of Scripture would say this. The student of the Bible would look at the struggles and the troubles of a groaning earthly creation, and we would say this, that indeed hurricanes are part of the curse of the fall into sin. But that God in his superseding sovereign design and purpose would come and that he indicates in his word that the world is graciously warned of the destruction that is to come through these and other unfolding events and disasters, giving them time to see the need for a Savior. You see, when the troubles of life come, the troubles and the struggles may be the very things that are calling you to look to God and to trust in God. One commentator puts it this way, in seeking comfort and protection, we go to God himself. 
All his attributes and all of his titles and all of his promises show that he is wise and loving. The struggle of trouble very often brings us to God. Listen to this. It is especially wise to seek God in the day of trouble. One great end of affliction, or one great reason for affliction, is to cause us to turn to look to God. The greater our distress, the more we need Him. Experience is a great school for Christians. Without it, they would be babes all their days. Through it, they are grown. It works hope. Affliction works hope that is not ashamed. When God's people are weak, they become strong in Him. When they are poor, they become rich in Him. When they are brought low, they were raised high in Him. When they are greatly afflicted, they are greatly comforted because He is an exceedingly great help in trouble. Psalm 46 verse 1. You see, without the struggles and the troubles of a fallen world, we could be merrily deceived without anything warning us that there's a coming problem, that we're not right with God. But when we see the horrors of this life, when we see the deformities of this life, when we see the diseases and the surprises and the conflicts and the rage of this world, when the nations rage against us, what we start to see is that this world doesn't have it together, and it needs God. And God is just gracious enough to say, I'll save you. I've made a plan. I've made a way. I've made a way to save you. So what redeeming does a hurricane, what redeeming value does a hurricane have for us in this day, in this time? It it causes us to look to something beyond ourselves. And it causes us to look to see the need for a gracious God. And he so beautifully, beautifully unveils his love by saying, I've come and I've taken the sting of death. So, as we look at this, I want to encourage you to carefully observe the works of God. Carefully observe the fact that the cross represents his victory over the greatest reality threat of your life, the threat of sin and death. And look and calmly trust and recognize him. One key question before we go this morning. Is God your fortress? Is your own personality your fortress? Is your retirement your fortress? Are your children your fortress? Do you, do you run into these various things thinking these are what's going to be, make you safe? Maybe for some of you would say, well, maybe I've been trusting in my own good works to be my fortress. I want to say to you that God says, let me be your fortress. Would you stand with me for prayer?